Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to see some old friends, uh, including several negotiators um, from other lives. Uh, and um, no, I don't have a crystal ball. I am not going to tell you what is in the TISA text uh, for reasons that have already been explained. Uh, but what I want to talk about uh, is the context uh, of the TISA negotiations, how uh, TISA is likely to extend what governments are already obliged to in the GATS, and what is in the GATS that TISA is likely to remove. If I haven't seen the text, how can we discuss this? Well, um, let me explain some possible sources. Um, some of us in this room have been working on this issue for a very long time. Um, I began working on trade and services in 1990 in the middle of the Uruguay round before the GATS. Yeah. And uh, some of us have been tracking it through, right through to the GATS 2000 era that Deborah was talking about. Uh, but uh, we all have been watching the children uh, of GATS uh, as they have emerged in the European Economic Partnership Agreements, in the various free trade agreements, uh, and currently for the last uh, four and a half years I have been working intensively on the, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement negotiations. Um, and so we can piece together from those and from public statements a pretty clear picture of what we think is likely to be on the table. So some context. Uh, as Deborah has explained, the GATS was in a way an experiment that tried to put legal rules around a corporate agenda. It was pragmatically adapted from the GATT and therefore it wasn't very perfect. Uh, I can see people writing, I'm happy to make these slides available. Um, the existing services uh, agreements that framed the GATS thinking certainly from the US and from New Zealand and Australia and some other proponents uh, were the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement uh, and the services protocol in the Australia-New Zealand uh, Closer Economic Relations Agreement. But because the GATS was um, resisted, especially by India and Brazil in the Uruguay round, uh, what resulted was far less than the ambitions that were sought. Indeed, the negotiations on financial services and telecommunications continued longer uh, because the US was not prepared to sign off what had been agreed to. When the inbuilt agenda for negotiations began in GATS 2000, it was even more contested from the inside, from negotiators, and from the outside, from people who were now more aware of the issues. And so the ambitions within the Doha round where GATS 2000 was incorporated were thwarted. You can only redesign the WTO's rules by consensus or by effective consensus, very high thresholds. And so the strategy has been to redesign the GATS through these alternative mechanisms. And we hear a lot of reference, especially in the two mega negotiations at present, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement and TTIP, to a 21st century agreement, a gold standard that will develop new templates to be used in future negotiations and significantly which will go further behind the national borders to impose disciplines on governments, decisions and processes than any previous agreements have done. That is to facilitate global structures that are premised on the rules of the major players and facilitate through supply chains of services their increased dominance of the global markets. 
The TISA negotiations, as we've uh, already heard, need to be seen as a part of a package. And we can expect that the rules that the US and the EU are developing in the TPPA and in TTIP will form the basis for much of the negotiation. But I think we can expect them to be more contested because what we have seen in the WTO itself is that the US and the EU are not agreed on some matters. The 23 participants uh, are all those that consider themselves to be fellow travellers in the project of uh, further liberalisation. But of course the plurilateral approach means those countries that are considered recalcitrant can be marginalised. So those who have blocked in the GATS 2000 negotiations can be shunted to one side whilst the gold standard rules are developed. There is reference to this being a living agreement, which means not only the rules can be continually developed and more commitments built in, but more players can be brought into a predetermined set of rules. And those countries who join, and I'll talk more about this shortly, must accept the gold standard and more. Those who are familiar with the WTO will know what we call its dirty little secret. And that is the terms on which countries join the WTO. They not only accept the obligations of existing WTO members, sometimes for developing countries much higher than those of existing rich countries in the WTO, but they must make commitments that are not even in the WTO texts, such as we promise to privatise. This is widely seen as inequitable, but those are the rules. What we can expect to see in TISA is uh, development of those rules that we've seen in the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement for those who join during the negotiations or those who sign on after the agreement is concluded. In the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, uh, we have seen this especially with Japan and Canada and Mexico. They joined with a blindfold. They had to promise to accept everything that had already been negotiated, but they were not allowed to see the text that they were accepting until they were at the table. Japan, in addition, needed to make certain pre-commitments before it was even allowed to come to the table. And there is a whole parallel set of negotiations occurring between Japan and the US, additional to the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. Now we can expect any of those countries that are currently thinking you might join these talks, this is what you will face. Those countries, if they conclude this negotiation and you decide you want to join, you will have to do TISA plus. You will not be allowed to join the party unless you do. So that is the context. Let's have a quick look at what some of the new rules might be. The US ambassador to the World Trade Organization uh, made the following classic statement. The US and other parties are envisioned are envisioning TISA as a highest common denominator approach in which commitments for all members are brought up to the highest degree of commitment of any single member. Now one of the features of the GATS is flexibility for individual countries especially in relation to their development status. And that was possible by the positive list that Deborah referred to. How are they going to achieve this objective? Well, currently 
TISA appears to be being negotiated as an Article 5 agreement. That is the way that free trade agreements, regional trade agreements, can avoid the obligations that what you agree to in this agreement you have to give to all the other WTO members. This is an exception to that if you meet certain standards. And the standards for services are that there must be substantial coverage of all of those sectors Deborah referred to in the agreement. However, rich countries consistently misrepresent Article 5. When they talk about substantial sectoral coverage, they say it must be 80 to 90 per cent of all of those sectors, from finance to tourism to professions uh, to health and so on. But in fact, if you look at the footnote, which us lawyers tend to do and negotiators tend not to, is that it says substantial sectoral coverage is based on a weighted combination of the number of sectors, the volume of trade and the modes of trading it, which means that the big rich services economies are the ones that should make the most commitments and the countries that are involved least in this trade are the ones who should make the least commitments which put together meet the test. That is not what TISA is talking about as you see from Ambassador Punk. And we have seen this consistently in the FTAs already. The European Union has done it in the EPAs, demanding poor countries take very high levels of commitments, which means that poor countries have to do a lot because they've got few commitments in the gaps. Rich countries have already made lots of commitments, so they only have to do a little bit. So they are very anti-development, asymmetrical agreements. And thanks to my colleague Sonia Reed smith for this diagram, you can see from the inner circle of GATS commitments to the next circle of those being made in regional trade agreements, to those that the US demands in its free trade agreements, how expansive these obligations are. TISA is supposed to go further than that. So for developing countries especially, but for every country, especially those without free trade agreements with the US, this will be huge. It will be achieved uh, in uh, several ways, apart from assumptions in good faith as negotiators you will meet these standards. One of the objectives of the agreement is to lock in countries' current levels of liberalisation and as you liberalise further, automatically lock that in too. Now whilst commitments, and I'm not going to get all technical on you, but whilst commitments in the area called access to your services market will still be based on the ones you list, the sectors you list, within those there will be an expectation that you automatically give the other countries the same treatment as your locals for all those sectors. So that is what we call on a negative list. And that will be locked in at its current level. You cannot move backwards from that. This will apply at central and we believe local government level. One of the flexibilities in the GATS is an obligation to achieve compliance at levels below central government um, by taking such reasonable steps as you can. In the more recent FTAs, that goes. It automatically applies at local government levels. And we should expect that some, at least, will demand that here. Unless you have managed to get that in your schedule. But schedules are negotiated. They have to be agreed to by the other parties. So thinking you can put all sorts of exceptions in there uh, is not the reality of the negotiations. And then there will be what we call the ratchet provision, which means every time you have a new government that is gung-ho about liberalising, 
automatically that will get locked in, so a new government comes in, is told, sorry, you can't do anything about changing that back. Now, why is this negative list approach a problem? Not only is it anti-democratic, but we know that there are high risks, from experience, there are high risks of errors in negative lists. You have to have a crystal ball. You have to know everything that is happening and make sure it is protected in your list, including in the future. There are not likely to be, you know, you've got a crisis. How are you going to deal with a crisis? You have a failure in regulation or privatisation. How are you going to deal with that? New technologies change the risks associated with a commitment in a service, especially if it's provided from offshore. Broad wording, thinking you've got a big carve-out, is vague and ambiguous, and if it's interpreted differently from what you meant, tough. There are flow-on effects then of these obligations for other rules that relate to what you have made commitments for. That mean rules, for example, on domestic regulation uh, may apply in ways that you never anticipated. And then there is the interface between your agreement here, commitments here, and what you have committed to in other agreements because the standard rule is that, um, as we're seeing in the TPP, whatever is better for the corporations in one or other agreement, they get to have that one, unless it is spelt out clearly otherwise. Now, there are many other rules in the GATS that will be expanded. There will be new sector-specific annexes on areas of importance to TNCs. There will be broader definitions replacing old, outdated ones. There will be clusters of commitments, for example, on logistics and transportation, that is from beginning to end. There will be new rules that we believe are going to try to lock in the right to provide services from offshore electronically and automatically as new technologies come in, they will apply and you can't revise it. The e-commerce chapter and the localisation chapter will mean that you cannot require a company that provides services offshore to have a local presence, which means regulated from offshore, difficult to sue, difficult to monitor, not being able to require that the data is held domestically. So protections for privacy and countries that have sweeping national security laws accessing data. So all of those are important issues. Possible that areas blocked in the gaps, such as government procurement or extensive state-owned enterprises disciplines will also be there. And new rules on transparency, not as you were talking about, <laughs> but transparency for the corporations to see more about what governments are doing and, yeah, and uh, be able to intervene in your domestic regulatory decisions. What is likely to be removed? All the development flexibilities fought for in the GATS. No special and differential treatment. No recognition of lower obligations for developing countries to make commitments. Likely to remove, possible, the ability to change your schedules, as uh, Deborah was talking about the Bolivia example at present. Unfinished business that the rich countries never wanted. Emergency safeguards if these rules impact severely on your services. And redefining terms that are problematic. We will hear later about mode four, the immigration one, they want executives to be able to move seamlessly around the world, but not troublesome, unskilled workers. So we can expect, as is happening in the existing agreements, they will redefine those. But other areas, such as uh, te um, temp employment schemes and so on, will be covered by services categories, uh, personnel services and so on. <laughs> 
Democratic transparency, as has been mentioned, we know from the leaked documents that there is an agreement amongst the parties that the text will not be released until it has been signed, by which time you effectively can't reopen it. But all the background documents will be withheld for five years after the agreement comes into force or after the negotiations are terminated. That is even worse than the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, which is four years. So the aim there is to shut down public controversy. But that has a habit of backfiring. And I had actually wanted to um, refer to, to one of the particular problems with that. When we have this kind of secrecy, we not only can't contest the claims that are made about what the benefits will be, we can't get bodies like human rights commissions and others to conduct impact assessments because they say we have nothing to work with. We cannot have effective select committee hearings and inquiries because they say it's still a work in progress. But if we don't get this until five years later, the governments that made these concessions and produced these drafts and put these proposals on the table will no longer be the government in power and therefore be held to account for what it did. And I suspect the five years for TISA is that some countries have longer electoral cycles than the ones in the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. So this is a very deliberate mechanism to deny democratic participation. Now there are many other things I could have talked about and I'm very happy if there are either um, uh, delegations or others who want to talk a bit more about some of the areas I haven't covered.